Welcome back to Tea Time in Olympia. I'm Lucas Miller, and my guest today is Kasha Rosetta, uh, Program Supervisor for the Equity and Civil Rights Office of the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction in Washington State. Uh, Kasha, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Um, so uh, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your, a few brief words about your background, and um, what exactly is it you do at the Office of, of Equity and Civil Rights at, at OSPI? Sure. So. Um, native Pacific Northwesterner, grew up just down the road in Eugene, Oregon, um, went uh, to school at various places, um, ended up teaching middle school after college, um, and then left that job to go to law school um, and start kind of a second career. Um, and so OSPI um, was a very perfect place to kind of meld those two careers into one. So at the Superintendent of Public Instruction's office, we um, our Equity and Civil Rights Office is really a unique office. Um, there are not that many states that have an, a subdivision within the agency specifically devoted to edu edu equity and civil rights. Um, and so we've really taken the lead, I think, in the country in terms of developing tools and resources for districts to help them ensure they're meeting their civil rights obligations. Um, so that's part of our job is to monitor districts for compliance with those civil rights laws, both at the federal and the state level. Um, we also develop resources and tools. We investigate and resolve complaints and allegations of discrimination. And probably our most important job is to serve as a neutral source of updated and accurate information for both families and districts. So people call us, they email us with questions, and we provide what we call technical assistance. Um, we don't provide legal advice. Um, we're not allowed to do that. Right. But we can certainly um, point people towards the right laws or offer guidance on how the law has been interpreted in our state. So, so um, because I think there's, there's maybe a little bit of confusion, tell us a little more about the relationship between OSPI, the school districts, the school boards. There's, there's obviously sort of a, a chain of command here that you know those different agencies address different issues. So for a parent who wants to advocate for their child, you know, suppose, you know, their child wants to be called by a certain name or a certain pronoun. Um, if the administration is not cooperative, where should that parent go? So that's one of the questions we get asked most frequently, actually. So Washington, in Washington, each school district needs to have three different compliance coordinators. So that's a district level employee who's received special training in one of these three areas. And the first area is just broad civil rights compliance. The mm -hmm. second is Title IX, which is a federal law prohibiting sex discrimination. And the third is Section 504, which is a federal law that prohibits disability-based discrimination. Okay. So depending on the nature of the person's allegations, so if it's a disability-based complaint, then you might want to speak to the 504 coordinator at the district sex discrimination or sexual harassment, Title IX coordinator, kind of everything else goes to the Civil Rights Compliance Coordinator. Okay. And on our website at the Equity and Civil Rights Office, we have a contact list that is actually organized by district um, that lists the names and contact information for each of those compliance coordinators. So okay. if families need that information, it's on our website, they can also call our office. But that's typically, when families call us with um, a concern, mm -hmm. we will generally say, have you spoken with the civil rights coordinator, whoever the appropriate person is, and often okay. provide them with that information? The idea being that if we can if we can work towards kind of an informal resolution as opposed to a formal complaint, right. sometimes that helps pr preserve relationships um, and get the matter resolved a little bit more quickly. Um, however, there is not an obligation to try and resolve it informally. A family has the right, certainly, to file a formal complaint if they'd like to. Right. And again. That is just a complaint in writing um, sent to that compliance coordinator or to the superintendent or really anybody at the district. Okay. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about the complaint process if that helps address the question. Um, sure, go ahead. Um, because a question that I get a lot uh, when I am, um, you, you've been to our support group mm -hmm. for parents of transgender nonconforming children, and many of those are school age children. And uh, what I hear a lot is uh, parents will go to the principal of their school and discover that the principal either like doesn't want to deal with the issue um, 
or doesn't know how mm -hmm. to deal with the issue, doesn't know what their obligations are under the law, uh, doesn't know what the actual rules, and doesn't know, you know where to look for that information, mm -hmm. what agency to, to go through for their particular school. Right. So, you know, if, if it can be clarified, you know, how parents kind of negotiate this, you know, or navigate this sort of complex, you know, constellation of, yeah. of agencies, you know, to get what's best for their child, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a question I, I get, mm -hmm. you know, a lot. Yeah, so when we have a parent call, let's say with an allegation um, that maybe their student, so our office deals primarily with allegations of discrimination. So in Washington, mm -hmm. state law has 13 different protected classes. So a protected class is a group that's defined under the law that gets special protection. So, right. you know, race, sex, creed, color, religion, national origin, all of these. Mm -hmm. Washington also includes gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So right. um, those, if a parent is, has concerns that their child has been either discriminated against, so differently treated, mm -hmm. um, or if they have been harassed or teased or bullied because of membership in a protected class, because mm -hmm. of gender identity, because of gender expression, then there is a specific policy and procedure that every district in the state is required to have. Okay. And that is a policy, it's, they typically most districts use um, the same numbering system for policies, so mm -hmm. if they do, that number is 3210 and 3210P. Those are the non-discrimination policy and the discrimination complaint procedure. Okay. We also have links to this on our website. We have a, a informational handout for parents that really walks them through how to file a formal complaint and what all of their options are. Okay. But if someone were to call our office and figure out, try and figure out who they were supposed to go talk to, right. our state law is written to encourage resolution at the local level. So okay. even if they were to avail themselves of a formal complaint process, mm -hmm. what they would need to do is put their allegations in writing. It can mm -hmm. be email, it can be handwritten, it can be faxed. Um, they can send it via the post office, they can drop it off, they can email it. However, it gets to the superintendent or one of the compliance coordinators, doesn't matter, mm -hmm. in writing saying why they believe the conduct was discriminatory or discriminatory harassment and what they'd like the district to do. Okay. At that point, under our state law, the district is put on a 30-day clock. So the moment that complaint is received, the district has 30 days to investigate those allegations okay. and give a written response to the parent. I see. Um, that summarizes the findings of the investigation and whether or not there's a violation of a policy, discrimination or not, and what the district's proposing to do to correct what happened. Okay. At that point, um, the parent has the right to appeal that decision up to the school board, mm -hmm. and the same process kind of repeats itself. There's a 10-day period to appeal, then the district uh, holds, the school board holds a hearing, the parent gets to come and present um, their allegations, speak with the school board. The 30-day clock ticks, and boom, school board decision. At that point, parents can file a complaint with our office if they're still dissatisfied. Okay. So the process really does start at the local level, at okay. the district. Right. Um, but I have found often that we have information sheets on the discrimination complaint process. We have them on gender identity and gender expression, so meaning what students' rights are and what district's right. obligations are. Right. And we have found that when we provide parents or families with those resources, it allows them to go to the school and really feel like they have a firm, they're standing firm in their knowledge and understanding of the law. Okay. Because sometimes we see there's a little bit, there feels like there's a power imbalance sometimes when parents right. are going to chat with school officials. And so this is hopefully designed to help level the playing field because if you can hand a piece of paper to the district and say, actually, well, it says right here. Right. That's really helpful. Yes. So... To summarize, then, I guess what we would say is parents, you know, check out our website, give us a call, figure out what your rights are, and then we would help kind of point you in the right direction as to who to talk to, what right. you should probably put in there, and how to eventually work towards resolution, hopefully. Okay. So. Now tell me, how does that, um, I know some schools have harassment, intimidation, and bullying report mm -hmm. forms. How, how do those fit into that process? Are those also... I mean, does the, does the state also have 30 days to act on those, or how does that? So that is a totally separate set of laws, and that oh, gets okay. super confusing, both for districts okay. and for families. All so right. under our discrimination law, so think of them kind of as silos. So on this side, we've got harassment, intimidation, and bullying. On right. this side, we have discriminatory harassment. Okay. 
in the discriminatory harassment silo, we have the bad behavior is being done because of protected class, so because of okay. a student's sexual orientation. Over here in the, the bullying, harassment, intimidation section, we have bullying not based on a protected class. Mm -hmm. I heard one district describe it as run-of-the-mill bullying, which I wasn't really a fan of because bullying is not something we want to ever normalize. I would think it would be hard to separate them sometimes. It I is. Mean, you know, yeah. So yeah. what we say is if the district is on notice that there is some type of bullying or harassment going on, mm -hmm. they have a duty to investigate it under one or both of these policies. So for okay. instance, let's say there's a situation where a kid's got, gotten shoved in the hallway or something. They, they start to investigate it under the harassment, intimidation, bullying, and then they realize that it's actually been going, going on for weeks, and it's because um, people are teasing the child about his gender identity. At that point, the district has an affirmative obligation to also kick it into discriminatory harassment. Okay. All right. So it shouldn't be on parents to have to recognize that. Right. Right, it should be on the districts. And mm -hmm. so and when we do our trainings with districts, we really try and emphasize that if you're investigating in one and you think it's, it has any semblance of discrimination, right. please use this procedure. Because the HIB, the HIB, uh, mm -hmm. Harassment, and Bullying, has a much tighter timeline and often the okay. remedies are, listen, are limited to discipline, disciplining the perpetrator. Right. Whereas over here in the discrimination land, we often are asking for more systemic I see. actions okay. and response. Okay. So, but that's an excellent right. question. And that so, we get so that two one separate more. policies, but with a fair amount of crossover. Oh, there can in, be. In actual practice. Yeah, and the one thing that's also confusing is that the harassment, intimidation, and bullying has a form. Yes. Discrimination complaints, no form is necessary. Okay. So any, any complaint in writing I should see. be accepted okay. by the district. It doesn't have to be in any particular form. They don't have to say magic words. All right. Uh, so uh, a lot of schools have... Um, you know, they, they have volunteers. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a member of Pizza Clatch, which is an organization that goes into the schools and provides support for uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, et cetera, students and their allies. Um, do you see ways in which community organizations like ours can partner directly with OSPI or with the school districts or school boards uh, to maybe get you know, better training for teachers or principals, um, you know, maybe more information available in the schools, um, you know, maybe uh, give people a better understanding of, for example, Washington's civil rights law or uh, the, the harassment, intimidation, and bullying policies. Um, what are ways in which, you know, most of these organizations are nonprofits, mm -hmm. you know, and you're a state agency, how do you how do you see the how do you see the partnership happening there? I think probably the most important thing that we can do for each other is just to get the word out that OSPI does exist and has mm -hmm. an office devoted to ensuring that students' civil rights are protected. Right. Um, and making folks aware of the resources that we have mm -hmm. already produced. Right. And then also that we're there, you know, at the click of a keyboard or pick, you know, picking up a phone. We're there to offer, you know, not legal advice, but offer guidance and share resources and point folks in the right direction. Um, and so I think that a lot of times people, when we direct them to our website or we speak with them on the phone, they're quite surprised mm -hmm. um, to find out that, that we exist at all. Right, and so right. that I think is the most important, important aspect is just getting okay. the word out so that Everyone is getting information from the same sources, and so we're not having this, right. it's this inconsistent messaging depending on which training you went to and that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember we had a we had an experience a couple of years ago. Um, we tried to start sort of an adjunct pizza clutch group um, at um, uh, Shelton, mm -hmm. and. Um, the students at Shelton were told that they could not, I think they, they tried to start a GSA and were told that they couldn't. You know, which I would have said was, isn't that, isn't that in violation of, of title, title nine or is it title seven? I don't know the specific statute, but I certainly would think that the district would want to look at um, its non-discrimination statement, which does say that it mm -hmm. provides equal access to different, yeah. different student yeah. groups. Yeah. Um, and so 
to deny a particular student group. Um, I think e districts have processes and policies for that, but they do, I mean, equal access to different student groups is kind of a, a key. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I believe the way it fell out was they were told that they could start a, they, they had to call it a diversity club. Hmm. Um, and uh, we did, we did for a little while have, have, uh, a couple of pizza clutch facilitators going out and, and meeting some students at the Shelton Public Library. Because it wasn't hosted at the school. Right. Yeah, um, that would certainly, I mean, I'm not someone who likes to kind of shoot out, off the cuff like this, but I do mm -hmm. think that um, that would be a situation where if somebody had called with that, we would have you know, taken their information, done the research, and then gotten back to them with, with the answer right. that they need. Right. I don't have it at the top of my head at no, easy no. disposal. Yeah. But, yeah, that would certainly, if, if a group is being denied the ability to meet on campus because mm -hmm. of yeah. one of those protected classes, that would certainly seem like that could be problematic potentially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, I, I know there's a difference between um, a GSA that's started and run by the students mm -hmm. and an outside nonprofit group, you know, that comes into the school, you know, as, as volunteers, uh, you know, to provide support. Um, and I think that uh, people aren't always qu clear on the difference, you know, how, how the different laws apply yeah. there. And that's something, you know? we don't get a lot of questions about that, so it's mm -hmm. something that's not completely fresh in my head either. Yeah. Um, so I can understand why others are confused. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Even school officials. Um, okay, so, um, so, so what do you find to be some of the biggest barriers you know, in, in providing protection for GLBTQ students or, or any other protected class of students? I mean, do you find that it's, you know, attitudes of local administration or is it, you know, bureaucratic difficulties? Is it that people don't know the laws? What do you, what do you think is like the, what do, you, what do you guys run into at OSPI as the biggest stumbling block to doing your job, essentially. <laughs> I think all of those things play uh, in to some degree. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge um, for OSPI and for school administrators is even if the folks the, at the administrative level, so even the super, if the superintendents and maybe the civil rights compliance coordinators have had that training, mm -hmm. making sure that it trickles down Okay. throughout the buildings, throughout the schools, and that it's consistent yeah. um, is something that, you know, you've played telephone before, right? Messages oh, can yeah. get a little bit yep. distorted oh, in yes. translation. So yes. um, we really try to emphasize, when we, inv we have, let me back up, but we have, we have the capacity, um, when we have the capacity to offer trainings to different districts, we entertain and consider those requests. Mm -hmm. um, we also go out and present at different conferences. So conferences including school counselors, school nurses. Um, I was at the Gender Odyssey Conference last month in Seattle. Uh, we go and do two different statewide civil rights trainings designed for civil rights compliance coordinators, one on the west side of the mountains, one on the east side of the mountains. So with an office of, we had there are three program supervisors and one managing attorney. Okay. So you know we're small, but we're mighty. Mm -hmm. And so we try and get the word out as much as we can, but that has certainly been a challenge, particularly in the civil rights compliance coordinator roles, because we've found that there's a quite a bit of turnover in those roles. Right. And so once you feel like you've gotten one bit up to speed, then maybe they've gone on to pursue a different opportunity, and so we're kind of starting back over again. Sure. So it's yeah. kind of, it's a reiterative process. Um, but each district in the state um, gets reviewed for compliance with civil rights laws, both federal and state, at least once every five years. Okay. And that's been happening uh, for, I think some districts are on to their second, their second review cycle now, so a decade, I'd say. I've only been at mm. OSPI for just under two years, so I'm right. not an expert okay. by any means. But, yeah. so that's an opportunity to go out into a district and really talk to folks, talk to teachers, talk to principals, athletic directors, yeah. um, secretaries, um, whomever and really get an idea of what's happening on the ground and whether those messages that are that we know we're conveying at the higher levels are trickling down okay so that's a huge challenge so making sure everybody's on the same page. on the same page yeah. and I do, I do think that people's attitudes particularly with regard to LGBTQ students are shifting it's just that there's this learning curve and right. people are yeah. really at different spots mm -hmm. and so our goal when we go out to train is you know 
to really try and meet people where they are and use you know positive reinforcement and just present these topics yeah. you know the rights of transgender students just present them yep straight up yeah don't dance around it the rule is the rule in Washington all students have the right to be treated consistent with their gender identity and express at school period right the right belongs to the student so we get a lot of questions from parents who may not approve or agree with their child's choice uh -huh. and that's a tough conversation to have to say that the right actually belongs to students so what the, yeah. the name and pronouns of the student yeah. requests those are the ones that we're going to honor unless there's some legal reason that we don't need to do so right well, that, that gets us into, since, since you bring that up, um, can you tell us sort of basically what the rules are as far as name, pronoun, um, what, what do the rules actually say right now? Yeah, so this is, um, it's really a lot simpler than people think, okay. I think. And really, it's the general rule is this. If you, if you take away nothing else, this is what you should remember, which is that in Washington, all students, whether cisgender, transgender, gender diverse, gender queer, gender fluid, have the right to be treated consistent with their gender identity. So nobody knows that better than the individual. So let the right, student, right. let the student needs to be consulted and let the district and the school know what, what they would like. Where we run into some problems um, is with, um, of course, locker room and restroom use. Right. And same rule, right? We go back to that same rule, consistent with gender identity. Simple. Okay. Now here's a question that um, when I when I um, asked similar questions a few years ago, it seemed to me that there was some language in the rules concerning um, the student's gender identity has to be what they present or, or express consistently at school. And most of us thought that there was maybe some difficulty with that language because, you know, a, a certain identity, you know, they may not be at a place where they're ready to present one identity mm -hmm. consistently. Yep. You know, so what do you do for students who are, you know, questioning or, you know, still exploring their right. identity or trying on different names or pronouns, mm -hmm. um, you know, who are, who are kind of in that seeking stage that, right. you know, all teenagers go through and <laughs> all, all young people have a right to go through. How do you reconcile that, you know, with how do you decide what is, you know, what is their gender identity that you have to be consistent with? Right, and that, yeah. we get that question a lot. And yeah. I think we're gonna get a lot more of it now that Washington's added the, the third option for birth certificates, right, mm -hmm. the X yep. now. Yep. Um, but the guidance, so our, our guidelines that we drafted that have that consistent language in it that you, that you pulled right. out consistently, mm -hmm. yeah. those were drafted in 2014, I believe. Mm -hmm. And as we've shifted, away from a binary framework, yeah. right? Yeah. We have adjusted our guidance. We're in the process of revising our guidelines to reflect kind of that shift. You did mention there was some new There's some new, new guidance, yeah. yeah. So yeah. with regard to gender fluid students or students who are just, who are trying to figure it out, right. um, our guidance to principals and to administrators is trust the student. And okay. whatever, they, whatever they are doing on a given day, mm -hmm. that is okay. All right. So Good. that is the guidance that we've been that we've been sharing with principals. Um, Good. It does get principals um, have tended to push back a little bit with regard to you know restrooms and locker rooms. But again, it's that same rule. You know, whatever the student knows their gender identity and whatever is resonating, that is right. You know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Um, with regard to, there has been a little bit of a shift in the guidance too. So we've gotten a lot of questions this year with a, with regard to which name do we use and on non-official educational records versus official educational records and how do we figure this out if our student information system only does X and, you know, so that's been kind of the point of, of friction this year so right. far. Okay. And um, again, the rule there is that unless there's some legal reason not to use a, the name a student requests, please just use the name the student requests. Um, student information systems at this point, um, the state law has said that in order to change a legal name, mm -hmm. you still need to have documentation of a legal name change, whether right. that's a court order sure. or an affidavit of common law name change. But to use the name and to respect a student's gender identity at school, you don't need that. All it is is a request. And that should be the student's name that they request should be put out on things like attendance sheets, class lists, um, state assessments. And that's a change this year, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So students 
uh, taking state assessment should have the name that they request on there. That does not need to be a legal name. Okay. In, under state law, the only situation that we're aware of where a student's legal name has to be used is on a transcript. Okay. And that's just the way that's written into the law. So until the legislature right. makes that change, there's not a workaround. However, um, I met with our student information folks a couple weeks ago at OSPI, and I was told um, that even if legal name has to be on a transcript, there are places on the transcript where other names can be listed. Okay. So while not front and center, it can still at least be there. Right. And that's where we are right now. So okay. there may be some federal reporting requirements that we're not aware of that require use of legal name, but our guidance to districts has been like just default to the name the student requests unless you can point your finger at a reason not to. That's legal authority. So that's the guidance that we're giving. Right. So legal authority would not include, for example, a parent calling the school and saying, you know, I don't want you using this, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a situation in a yeah. pizza clutch where, a, where a, a, a youth wanted to use a certain name and pronoun at school uh, and their parent, who was not supportive, called and basically forbid the, the teachers and the principal to use the student's preferred name and pronoun. But you're saying basically, OSPI policy is on the side of the student in that case. Yeah, we, we tend yeah. to say that the right belongs to the student. I, we yeah. don't tend to say it, we say right. that. The right yeah. belongs to okay. the student. And those situations are really hard because, yeah. um, you know, one of the things that we know from research is that having an affirming, supportive family is really critical for oh, all yeah. students. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so when this situation occurs where the student knows and wants one thing and the parent's not on board, that can be really challenging. So it's yeah. important that there's somebody at the school who can talk to the student and make sure that, you know, so at parent-teacher conferences, let's talk about this. What right. is going to make you safe? What is going to make you most comfortable? Which name? Just checking in with a student. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes that we forget to do that too. As yeah. I used to teach and I feel like that's something that as teachers we are, we're very concerned about the parent and we're right. also very concerned about the child, and it, we yeah. need to really remember that that's that's our priority as the child. Yeah. So. Okay. Good. That's yeah. good to hear. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. So, um, say more about the bathroom and locker room. Yeah. Issues. Where Where are we at with that? Yeah. So, um, it's been an interesting conversation as these federal court cases have popped up over yeah. the country, right? I mean, yeah. this is the issue that's being litigated is restroom use of yes, all the possible well, things. Right? Not to mention what's been going on right here in the state, you know? Right, with the, with the initiative, yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, so I actually um, have been, it's an area of interest of mine, so I've been doing some research into it and I've presented on this topic on several occasions, just kind of what is the legal landscape look like across the country for trans students with regard to this issue. And as you know, with regard to this happened with the LGB community as well, where the rights really depend on zip code. Hmm. And yeah. that to us, that is really, really yeah. sad. Yeah. Um, and so here in Washington, we have wonderfully robust civil rights laws. So our trans students are protected by state law. Mm -hmm. In other states, that's not the case. And right. with the withdrawal of the guidance um, by Secretary DeVos that had said yeah. that we should be treating trans students consistent with gender identity and that claims um, these restroom and bathroom and locker room cases could be brought under Title IX, which is the federal law prohibiting sex discrimination. Well, that guidance was pulled away in February right. 2017. So right. we're left with a little bit of a policy vacuum at the federal level which is why all these cases have been popping up. Yeah. But the good news is that with only two exceptions at the district court level, so that's the lowest level of this trial court in the federal court system, right. all but two cases have come out in favor of the students, okay. which is outstanding. Yeah. At the yeah. circuit court, so the federal courts of appeals, all of the cases have turned out favorable for trans students. And so that momentum yeah. is really encouraging. Um, you know, so that, at least we have that going for us. Right. Um, here in Washington, we found that districts have been, for the most part, very willing to think outside the box. Of course, the privacy thing comes up. You know, what do we do if someone's pretending to be transgender so they can peek in the bathroom? We really try and nip that in the bud and say, you know what? 
That's actually a behavior issue. Yeah. That has nothing to do with gender identity or being transgender. Exactly. You already have a policy in place to deal with peeping in the bathroom, I would hope. Right. So go ahead and use that if there's yeah. somebody behaving inappropriately. Oh, and by the way, inappropriate use does not mean just using the restroom or changing right. your clothes before PE class. Yeah. So schools have been really, for the most part, great about this. They've gotten creative about solutions for giving all students more privacy. Because what student doesn't want more privacy in a locker room or a bathroom? Sure. Right? So they've hung PVC pipes with chains and shower curtains to make individual changing areas. They're installing European style bathroom stalls which go down to the floor. Mm -hmm. um, these are really inexpensive fixes yeah. that can really help alleviate this stress without stigmatizing anybody. So That's good. Yeah, so yeah. that's been, um, it's been, it's been actually kind of fun to see what the districts have come up with um, to try and support their students in this way. So good. I've been encouraged. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so what else, what more would you like to see happen in the future, uh, to make, just to make our schools safer for GLBTQ youth and youth of color, mm -hmm. youth with disabilities, you know, everybody, you know, what, what, what is your, what is your, you know, what's your wish list, My wish you know, list as, as far lengthy. as, you know, what we could, <laughs> you know, I mean, we've, we've, it sounds like we've made some, some good steps. Where would you like to see us go from here? I think um, one of the most important things um, is really just getting everybody on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and so mm -hmm. whatever we can do to kind of spread the message that in Washington, these are the rules, this is how we do things, this is how we conduct business, this is right. how we treat students. Um, that's gonna be really important. Um, I also think that making sure people know about their district's non-discrimination policy and the complaint procedure okay. is really important. And right. I had the opportunity, I think two years ago now, to go to the Gender Odyssey Conference and present, and Gavin Grimm was there. So the big wow. plaintiff for the case, yes. the transgender yeah. restroom case, went to the Supreme Court of the United States and then got kicked back down, is in limbo know, at the moment. Yeah. But, yeah. And I asked him, I got to ask him a question, I was a little starstruck, but I did ask him, what, what can schools do? What's the one thing they can do to make students feel safe? And he, without even skipping a beat, he said, you've got to have a policy that protects kids based on gender identity and gender expression, and you have to enforce it. So that, he's like, that just sets up an environment where it sets the tone. Right. Where this is just how we do things here. We are not going to discriminate based on that. And yeah. that, he said that the, having that exist mm -hmm. You know, it's something to point to if something goes wrong, right? There's a, yeah. there's a remedy. Um, yeah. So getting people on that on the same page, and I know that this year in the legislature there was a bill that would have required a, a policy specific to transgender students mm -hmm. to be mandatory. Right. And currently, as that stands, districts it's an optional policy. Districts can certainly adopt a specific policy um, discussing how trans students are going to be accepted and welcomed. They don't have to, um, and. We, we encourage that strongly, however. Yeah, yeah. But it's good to know that in Washington, at least, even if they don't have that tr policy specific to trans students, mm -hmm. trans students are protected under that non-discrimination policy and procedure already. So right. it's an extra layer, okay. um, which we think would be wonderful, but you know, it's not like there's not a floor, um, right. which is nice. So getting everyone on the same page, um, I think is really important, as well as just making parents and students um, encouraging them to take advantage of their options for dispute resolution, so the informal options, talking to the compliance coordinators, right? If they need to, filing a formal complaint. I mean, districts have obligations, students have rights, and so that's why that process exists. Right. So, and to understand, also, this is important, there's an anti-retaliation provision. Yeah. So, they can't, districts can't then take an adverse action against anyone who's filed a complaint, which helps people sometimes when they're in that yeah, sticky situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, it's interesting you mentioned Gavin Grimm because I would think that one thing that, you know, the, that OSPI and the districts and, and, you know, the school boards would, would benefit a lot from, I think, is getting the youth themselves more involved, you know, in, in these processes, in the, in the, you know, having more input into making making new policies, um, you know, becoming, you know, maybe have youth members on school boards, you know, I don't, do you, th do you see that as like something we might 
move toward in the future? If Man, on a personal note, I love that idea. Yeah. Um, I think that would be fantastic because mm -hmm. I think that often we as adults have such different concerns and worries yep. than students. And yeah. so we make sure in our presentations and trainings to have at least two slides that say, don't forget to ask the student. Right. P.S. Don't forget to check in with the student. And if you don't feel comfortable doing so, chances are somebody else will. So mm -hmm. let's make sure yeah. that we're checking in in an age appropriate way and making sure that we're taking their thoughts and feelings into account. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. So if they can stomach staying through a board meeting. Which you know, very we, well, I mean, we have a couple of, of youth members on our pizza clatch board. And, and, you know, I find that if you, if you, you know, when they're really invested, yes. you know, they will get engaged. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I mean, it's a great thing that they can put on their resume, too, mm -hmm. as they're preparing, oh, yeah. you know, for the yeah. workforce. Something like that, that civic engagement says a lot for yeah. students. Yeah, and for the, for the schools that require uh, community service right, right. as graduation requirements, yep. you know, that, yeah. that, can be, that can be very, very helpful. Um, how, you know, how else can we become involved? Is there, um, is there like, a public comment opportunity for OSPI? Is there a way that parents and students and just community members and, and uh, organizations that serve youth you know, can can engage and give feedback and, you know. Yes, there is. So in an informal sense and then not in a formal sense at the moment, um, but so in the informal sense, um, I am one of those rare people that actually likes to answer their phone at work. And okay. so if people have something to say. <laughs> that is rare. I, it is, but I love it. I just never yeah. know who's going to be on the other end. Um, so if you have feedback or you think that a district is not doing something well or mm -hmm. you think a district mm -hmm. did do something really fantastic, we are all ears. I would yeah. love to hear from people. Um, and that's part of the, I think, the message that, you know, that we exist and that we're there to help people understand these civil rights laws. And they're complicated and they're kind of written by lawyers, so they're confusing. But <laughs> right. we do our best to try yeah. and translate yeah. them into plain English and so that people have a really solid footing. Um, as far as formal public comment, um, our office has not revised its regulations since 2012 or 14, but during that time when we're, when we're redoing rules, there's always going to be public comment where people can submit comments. They can either attend hearings and share their feedback or testify, mm -hmm. or they can submit their public comments in writing. We just went through a big rule revision with discipline, right? and so we actually just wrapped that up. So that, that went on, I think, for nearly 18 months. So wow. different, you know, processes okay. where we had public comments, then change the rules, and then reissue. So that opportunity will exist if we were to decide to reopen our regulations. But informal comments, of course, feedback, of course. Now, just out of curiosity, do you find there's any kind of significant difference between the issues that you hear about, um, say, at the high school level versus the younger, younger ages? Yeah, a little bit. I think the issues mm -hmm. are the same, but I think parent involvement is what mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. different. Um, yeah. Although, yeah, the issues pretty much remain the same. I'm thinking, in particularly with regard to trans students, the big issues that we've heard at all levels, the questions we get are about names and pronouns. Mm -hmm. um, which sports teams can we play on? And the answer, we go back to that general rule of yeah. whatever the student's gender identity yeah. is, um, yeah. that's where they're going to play. Um, but it really is, it is kind of the same issues. We have found though, just from kind of anecdotal evidence, just talking to folks, mm -hmm. that um, when there is a difference of opinion, it doesn't tend to be between students, right. but it tends to be between adults and students. And okay. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic that students, mm. especially the younger students, are kind of rolling with, with it, um, with gender being a more fluid concept. So I think it's mm -hmm. interesting to see how that shifts over time, too. Okay. Do you find that the con conflict is like more between students and teachers or students and parents or students and their friends' parents? or All of those things. Okay. Yeah, I, right. think, I think there might be, and this is just me speaking on a personal note, but I think mm -hmm. that um, there may just be some generational differences that mm. you know, are contributing to that. But I think that um, from what we've heard on the ground, at least, um, the, the students, you know, for instance, when a student's transitioning, um, mm -hmm. they've been 
for the most part, the feedback we've been heard is that students are like, okay. That pretty much matches what I've heard. Is that the, <laughs> the kids tend to take it in stride. It's always, it's always the adults, either the right. teachers or the, you know, parents of friends who are, who are, you know, raising an issue. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you want to, is there anything more that you wanted to say about, uh, about new policies that are in place or? I think we, we covered the new guidance about state assessments and transcripts. Um, yeah, the policies haven't changed a ton since they were put into place. So mm -hmm. general rule stands. Um, but I guess I would just encourage people to reach out and contact us with questions. Um, you know, we, we try and reach out to districts and be proactive in our education rather than reactive. Right. We found that's a much healthier approach, kind of helps build relationships and keep those relationships um, healthy. Sure. Um, but, you know, the, the students and the families are the ones who are out there every day in yeah. the schools. And so hearing from them and their perspective, we know what, what should be happening. Right. But often, as but we what's know, actually what's going actually on. happening? Yeah, I mean, I hear it in my pizza clutches all the time that, yeah. you know, it's like, well, we know that the law says this and the policies say that, but when it comes down to an interaction between, you know, a student and say a teacher, you know, that we're we're hearing a lot of stories about like discipline being unevenly mm -hmm. applied in ways that are pretty clearly about, you know, something like race or gender mm -hmm. expression or sexual orientation or you know disability status or you know whatever and yeah so the reports from the ground i imagine would be pretty useful in mm. in you know guiding you know where all these agencies go um, yeah from here exactly yeah, and yeah. the discipline is interesting because that is definitely um become more of a hot button issue, not only in Washington, but across the country. Oh, yeah. I know that of course, yeah. since OSPI is released, it's released pretty um, incredibly detailed discipline analytics so that yeah. districts can go in there and separate out by race, by sex, by EL status, disability, yeah. and kind of look at their proportionalities mm -hmm. to see if there's any disparities. And we, in our state law, one of the laws that we enforce, there's an annual requirement that districts do take a look at discipline data, and then also course and program enrollment data. So who's taking what classes, who's in your right. APs, your IBs, your high caps, your, your CTE, your career and tactical ed classes. Break that data down by sex, race, EL, status, and disability to see if, if those, if there are any disparities between their, their total enrollment and then enrollment or student discipline. And so right. that is something that um, districts are getting better at. Um, and we have a really solid set of resources on the website about discipline just because that's been such an important issue. Sure. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think the other important message is that if something feels wrong, it might be. And if you say something yeah. Yeah. or take it, you know, call us and we can help you kind of winnow that that down. But to not say something, sure. right, then we get into that situation where microaggression, 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 Obviously. microaggression. So, yeah. so I, it, it's scary and it's hard, but the laws are designed to be there to help protect people. So we want people to be able to take advantage of them. Yeah. <laughs> really do. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think that talking to more people who have, are in the schools on a daily basis would be right. incredibly helpful. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, so uh, any final message you'd like to leave our viewers <laughs> with? Any take home messages that, that uh, I think just that we are here and we would love to help um, point you in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, thank All you. Right. Kasha Rosetta, Program Supervisor of the Equity and Civil Rights Office of OSPI. Thank you very much thank for being so with much. us. Thank you so much. And that's all for tonight. And thank you for joining us. This is Luke Miller at Tea Time in Olympia. Have a good night.